few things I would like to mention again. Very, very um, down to earth. We are in a PLC lab, so you guys look around these black boxes are Siemens S7200, I believe, with their inputs and outputs. So this just going over uh, PLCs. Why do we care being electrical designers about PLCs? These are the brain and the driver for all the VFDs that we do in our equipment. When, they, when, we, when we went guys to Allianz and we look at all their chillers, they're all driven by soft start and VFDs. Most of them have VFDs on them and the pumps. These VFDs have to interface with a complete control system. Johnson control, tie all these loose end control and make the system work smoothly together so it can give you a, a, the best performance heat and cool in the building. You can't just do that by, wire, by turning on a, a pump. So you need to drive all these and control them. A couple of things about PLCs. Um, if you guys go to PLCs, the, the word PLC means, uh, means a lot to a lot of people. Um, um, anybody, you know, if you see a PLC in the electrical industry, there's another term for PLCs, obviously programmable logic controllers, a brain that you can program with inputs and outputs. So you put some type of program in the, uh, the uh, processor and you have the inputs that can get you the signals and then you have the arms that, um, that implement these decisions that the PLC is going to do. Um, Chris, if you do power transmission, PLCs means a whole lot to you. They, they use the term PLCs to mean, I believe, power line carrier. So if you ever do medium voltage and you hear the word PLCs, be very careful because you use it differently. They use power line carrier. Power line carrier is a signal that they impose on the transmission line so they can regulate the transmission of power from A to B. So that's another major term for PLCs. That's not what we're talking about here. Um, PLCs and computers. PLC guys is a, a, some type of a computer with a brain. A couple of things guys about that we're going to touch about um, is the IOs. If you're in the computer business, these are the eyes and the ears and the senses of the computer, the IOs. Inputs and outputs right on that way. Um, you need, so IOs is your inputs and outputs, your hands and legs and eyes, right? Your, hand, your eyes and, um, and, and then you have the decision making, the CPU is your decision making process or central processing unit which is your computer and then you have the interface so you can program the PLCs. Very simple, you have a brain and you have a way of programming this brain and you have input you can get the signal and arms so you can implement these signals. That's really more, almost all the control system programmable or non-programmable are made out of the almost the same thing Chris. You, you get input, you put it in a some type of processor, you cook it, you program it, and you send an output to turn things on and off. Um, draw diagrams that connect the inputs and the output modules together. So that's a few things we're going to look at um, in less than a second here. Okay, here you go. So a couple of things about PLCs and computers, guys. This is just uh, literature, not a big deal. I want to highlight a few things. You, my laptop, most of PLC is Chris. You're going into a very harsh environment, extreme withstand, extreme harsh environment in temperature wise, vibration, shock. If you guys have a chance to go to Chad Curtis' YouTube channel and you look at some of the stuff, uh, videos that I took from the North Star Steel, um, and you can see their business is cr crushing your car after it's crushed, cutting it into pieces and melting it. So imagine how dirty and how hot and the amount of vibration. And all these equipments that crushes, that melts, is driven from PLCs. So imagine that PLC have to handle all this stress, or to have to be isolated. So that's the difference. They they make them robust, can handle, or they put them in a robust environment um, that can handle all this temperature and vibration. Um, another thing, guys, in the power industry, five volt is meaningless. Five volt in the power is meaningless. Plus and minus 10% on any voltage system for 80 guys is meaningless. You put 5 volt in the PLC, that's the signal that you're going to get on or off from that device. So it becomes the spikes. Voltage, voltage spikes, guys, is a big deal. Um, and so PLCs are designed to handle the voltage spike much better than a lot of other computers. Um, and again, it survives in an environment where there is a lot of corrosion and dirt and so forth. It's meant to be in a manufacturing plant to drive a process. So that's just a few literature about the difference between my laptop and a PLC.
Um, any comments, guys, any questions before? This is just a few. Um, the PLCs that they have in this plant, North Star Steel or Gurdu, they have them actually, a lot of them are set in a separate room, clean room, and driving the whole process. Some of them are right next to the equipment in a really harsh environment. So um, if you have a chance, as I said, go look at the, the way they do all these uh, melting of steel. Okay, the most important thing is the parts that PLC has. How many PLC parts? Uh, you guys are very familiar with that one. You have, you have the PLC here. So part of your PLC is going to be, this is the CPU, the brain, my computer, and this is the power source right here, get you the power. And you have the input in, in here, and out in here. That's it. Really not a whole lot. So you have the power. Chris, your power, you can convert AC to DC, so you can power this computer. And then the CPU is that processor. We all know that's my laptop, the processor of my laptop. And then the programmable, they call them programmable terminals. That could be push buttons on the screen, or it could be a device you plug into the PLCs and you program it with. And IOs, so-called IOs. These are the eyes and the ears and the hands and the legs of the, of the, of the equipment. Any question guys about the basic components of a, a PLC system? And Siemens a bit major one. GE has a lot. Uh, Alan Bradley, a few. Uh, Johnson, uh, tons, tons of, of those guys. But I can't emphasize, guys. The most important thing is for us. I wish we have a, a control design program. We don't. But that's kind of at least get you as close to a control design program as, as you can. So um, the, the list of the PowerPoint presentation guys go include all these four components. The power source, why do we need a power source, Chris? You know about this more than I do. You're going to take your 120 and convert it to uh, most of them work on this voltage, DC 5 to 24 volt. So take the incoming voltage, whatever your incoming voltage. So it could be 120 most of the time, but it could be also 28 volt. AC, take your AC voltage, convert it to DC voltage, regul regulate it, and dump it across the PLC. That 24 volt allowable can be used for two things. Number one, you can use it first to, to cook the PLCs, make the PLC work, power the PLC. They call it power the PLC. And number two, they can use also the 24 volt to signal, to get you a signal of 24 volt. Use it as 24 volt signal. Um, now, um, if you have a voltage of 5 to 24 volt, a voltage you drop, guys, of 5% on this system could be crucial. I mean, it, 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 it will kill you. Um, so the, you can't afford to lose 5 volts on a system of 5 to 24 volt. But if I, if I lose 5 volt on a 25 volt, I will end up with 215 volt. That's an acceptable, I'm sorry, 150 volt. That's an acceptable voltage. That's okay. You lose a 5 volt in the system, you lost the signal. So if it's supposed to go on, it's not going on. So what I'm trying to say is spikes, sweeps, the voltage field spikes, and other electrical noises, they call it, is a big, big deal, guys. Uh, because we are dealing with smaller voltages. A smaller a spike on a smaller voltage can uh, make, when you type CHAD, it and end up on the screen, actually. It uh, corrupts your data. Uh, they say regulated within 5% of the required value. So they have some type of regulation to regulate it within 5% of the incoming value to get you the outcome that you want. The second, so that's a power source, bringing the, really the main reason of the power source, get rid of the spikes, convert 5 to a 24 volt DC, dump it across the, the, PL, uh, the PLC. The most important thing in the PLC is the brain, microprocessor. The microprocessor chip here, guys, that's the, um, the mother of all evils in the electronic industry. That's what your laptop and my laptop and everything else is made of. That's where you, all the programming and the logic function guys happen. Um, it's exactly like your laptop and my P, my, uh, my, uh, the PCs, if they have PCs anymore. Um, so these are, these are the brain, all these electronics that happen and digital equipment that happen in Ukraine. So that's where the, with crunching the number of the programming, machine programming, and so, so forth happen. Um, okay, so that's your CPU. Then you can have uh, plug connections to get into the CPU, you get the signal from the input output to the CPU. Um, and then you can, when you program it, you can have 
self that uh, what do you call it self diagnostic uh, programs that you can run on the PLCs to to find itself and also the programming that we do guys we have seen is that 7200 right here on the wall right there when you program it through a laptop you can download this program on your on your drive and store it for future use or, or modification and so forth so this is where everything happened right in the CPU can I get you guys to believe that this is our lap? This is basically your laptop hard drive right into it. Um, the terminals, programmable terminals. This is the key, your key, your keypad. That's where, for the most part, it's going to be your keypad. You can use it to program the PLCs um, or it's a keypad or troubleshoot it. So that's. Um, has a lot of uh, signals, guys, that you can come out of it, LCD or LED um, handheld devices with that displays LCD and LED signals, troubleshooting. Um, so it's really nothing other than the keyboard. Keyboard. Most of the stuff that we use here, guys, are done with again, S7200, and I believe the Alan Bradley, all of them, Chris, are programmable via laptop. So you. Some, some of them, I don't know, in the past, they used to have the handheld uh, programmer they can plug it into and do it. It's smaller computer. Now with... Before laptops, that's Yes. Uh, yeah. Now it's uh, you have a laptop where you can plug a laptop in any PLCs and, and retrieve information, download information, control it. So the limitation is... Uh, is there's, uh, there's no limitation on what you do. Okay. Uh, we'll talk, guys, about how... We have a, we'll talk about this one, the inputs and outputs in a second here as we go through. Um, the terminals, as I said, you can build uh, most of, when you when you do programmable terminals, all what you're inputting, ours that we use here, S7200, we have a software that can come with. Did you guys get the software new you Gary? You can download the same on our standard. Yeah. Standard. standard. Yep. Um, our electrical students will use it. So basically, you can, it's really straightforward. You can drag and drop all these symbols. Normally closed contacts, normally open, normally open contacts, normally closed contacts, coil, um, all these devices, <coughs> drag and drop, and then you can connect them with a the wire um, as you dr uh, drag and drop them. So these are the inputs you, a few inputs that you can find from the software that we use. Normally open contact, close. This is a coil. Every time you see this one, this will coil. This is down wrong and close wrong. What you're looking at, guys, in, um, in PLCs, they love the word uh, ladder diagrams. Uh, what you're looking at here is a ladder diagram. So they, how we draw them. We'll talk about the ladder diagram, how they do them in a second here. Um, Chris, you always end up always at the end here with a coil. When you do a ladder diagram, Rule number one, every wrong must end up with a coil. So you can energize or de-energize that coil. Uh, input output tracks. These are the outside, these are the eyes and the ears of the of the system. That's how you interact with the with the outside world. And this is where we interface with them, guys. I have my VFD, right? <clears throat> and I need to get signals from my VFD into the PLC so I can control it. You get into the IOs, they call them IO racks. You connect it obviously to the CPU. Um, it brings the input information and the output information modules. It's input information modules bring endpoint to the CPU uh, by sensing <coughs> by a sensing devices press. You have to have a sensing devices to do that. And um, and also you need output devices that they can send a signal to the field. So you sense that temperature is hot, right? and get to the computer it says if the temperature is hot analyze this one as energized coil number 55 coil number 55 would be the coil that's going to run the air handling unit so it can cool the building really no rocket science out of that input outputs any question guys about the io racks the io they call them io racks Oh my God, Chris! There's so many, so many types of sensors. Uh, there's 20 milliamp loops that you can use. There's a, um, a temperature sensors. There's 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 a well there's a analog ones and digital ones. The digital are on off very easy. Either the situ either you have five volt or you have zero volt. That's really easy. The the analog one is that they lose the 
I think they use 0 to 10 volt lube or uh, 0 to 20 milliamp lubes, they call them. That's where you can measure a process in progress. Um, again, you, the, the limitation is um, there is no limitation on what you can measure. Most of them, guys, the, the easiest way, as, as you said, Chris, is on off. On off is a switch on position, off position. That's easy to do. Um, so you have a signal of 5 volt or you have a signal of 0 volt. So that's on off, 0, digital. The other ones, as I said, the loops, is it, it measures you know, it, it measures the impedance. It converts the heat into an impedance, the heat or the temperature or the fluid into convert it into a, an impedance and measure the current and or the voltage through this impedance. And when you capture the, the voltage and or the current, you dump it into the PLCs, it will tell you the temperature at this point is here or here or here, anywhere else. Okay, capacity guys, um, the inputs and outputs always determine the size of, and the cost of the PLCs. You know, how many inputs, how many output, output tracks you want, depending how many process you want to control and how many signals you want to control this process. So big deal. Um, you can go from uh, 16 inputs into hundreds of uh, input output devices or modules. And again, the more, like everything else, and I'm not a computer engineer, the more inputs you bring and outputs, what happens to the processor? It slows the processor. And when it gets into that deep, how many inputs and outputs guys we need, you really now you get into the control, a control engineer, uh, designing the process for you. This is not as easy as putting uh, an eight outputs here in S7200 and programming it. Uh, how many out outputs do I need for this um, uh, steel melting shop that has five, uh, uh, like uh, four shops, and these are uh, thousands of motors and welders and arc welders and so forth that you need to control uh, sometimes at the same time? That becomes uh, really, really involved. So, any question, guys, about the major? I just want you to get the big picture, really, from the CPU into IOs, um, into the programming these uh, these equipments. Um, it, this is really interesting. The input modules, guys, it's so important to electrically isolate, and that's what conf used to confuse me. We are. How do you interface a, a 600 volt system? with a 24 volt DC system. It's confusing, right? How would you get a signal 120 or 28 into a PLC that runs at 24 volt DC? The whole idea is very, when you bring your inputs, there's a couple of pictures that's really interesting. Here's one of them. When you bring your inputs, guys, I can bring an input signal here that's, let's just say for 120 volt. I got a signal 120 volt. There's MOBs, these MOBs are, will take care of the spikes, they're meant these are your spike, uh, killer spike detector. If there's any spike on the voltage, you don't want to dump it across your diodes and burn it, Chris. So these MOBs are protecting devices for a spike. So they take a spike in the system, kill it. So here's you brought a signal like this, guys. If there's any spike, a spike on a signal, as you know, is, uh, it goes all the way up to the Lord, comes down to the devil here. That's a spike. What happens when you put it across this MOB, shunt the spike, cuts it right in here. So long story short, it clean the signal for you, at least from the spike. Then, what happened down here is they've converted to 24 volt. Here's my, now we convert it. This is a, a full bridge, right? Convert it from 120 AC input signal, clean it from the spikes, the, convert it via a bridge into 24 volt. Now, here's the fun thing. Now I can bring this 24 volt and tie it directly to the CPU. But what happens if you put it directly to the CPU? You could burn the CPU from any fluctuation in the voltage, um, and you don't have, and you can have any, any. So you can, you don't want to put this 24 volt directly into the CPU to protect the CPU and to protect your signal. So the smarter than Chad, what they do is they put a, a resistor to current the limit, and they put the beautiful LED guys that you all know, a device. Take that current, the I here, take the I, convert it into light. Again, this is light inside the, PL, inside the input of the PLCs, inside our PLC input. So it converts into the light. There's another photocell uh, transistor that take that light, actuate and close or open a contact. Close and open a contact. So you're using the light to actuate a transistor, to turn a transistor on and off. 
what they call this is what they call it iso um what do you call it up to isolation up to isolation electrical up to isolation to electrical electrically separate the incoming signal from the cpu does that make sense we don't get involved in you don't get involved in, this is inside everything all that you care about guys this here is an input that's what you see what you're looking at inside this box this is your input device input module you bring your wires in here and um, and actually and the C, this is also include the cpu and this is your you just you, all what you do is just bringing two wires into the inputs of that device all this iso um my uh, my up to isolation happens directly inside the module cool so same thing like I said you bring the power into led goes on the led will uh, uh, there's a photo transistor detect the light and signal the cpu that there is a voltage so it gives the on to the to uh, plc to the uh, cpu any question guys about this the basic input again inside the box here list this is where you bring your signal that's what they how they take a 120 or 480 or 600 volt signal and interface that signal with a 24 volt system always you have to convert it into dc from the dc you go back I, now this is to convert to dc so we can control it and this one is to isolate it electrically can you guys see i can't i know everybody can see that there's isolation here there's nothing electrically connection we're tying two things via light the only the only comment between the cpu and the input device is a, a light yes sir fiber optics. fiber optics is the same thing yep fiber optics next the uh, a chapter not next chapter the chapter after is going to talk about the same thing with fiber optic getting signal in and out into plcs or into somewhere else Okay, so this is your input device. We'll look at a couple of input devices, guys. Out, output modules, the same thing, they have um, isolation between the, also the output, they have an isolation between the output devices and the CPU. You always need this type of isolation. Um, either you do optical isolation or you can isolate via a small relay where you could energize one coil and close the contact to the other side. And you do not provide power for equipment. In PLCs, you have to have your own, you provide the signal. The equipment will have its own power. All what you have to do is provide the signal. So here's an output, typical output, uh, a lot of output device. Uh, typical, everything inside the box in, is inside the PLC. So when, um, when you send the signal, when the brain makes a signal and put, and put some voltage here, let's say five volt came in here, goes through this LED, convert it into diode, then Mr. Photo Triac here, Photo Triac is uh, a fancy diode that can handle three, uh, 480 volt almost, say 480 volt if I want here, right? It has to be rated for this. So what you do guys is this light will actuate this uh, triac, a special type of transistor, and close it. It's a electronic switch. Close it. Now, when you close it, what's going to happen to this relay? Energize. You put 200, 480 volt across this relay. When you put 480 volt across a relay, what's going to happen to the relay? Actuate the relay. This relay could be driving one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. And here's your 500 horsepower, 600 volt machine. So I made the PLC. Put a five volt output into the uh, the uh, diode, burn it as light. Detected. I don't design this. This is designed in the smart and chat design this electronic. Detect the light through this uh, photo triac. Actuate the uh, triac. Basically close it. When it gets the five volt, it closes it. When it closes it, it puts a. Let's just say the voltage, the control voltage that we're using here. I actually can almost do it this way. Uh, press. I can bring one here and one here. Look at that. And here's my 600 volt. I'm just assuming they're going to do it for 600 volt. I brought the 600 volt across the coil, and this is my uh, M, and these are M, M, M. 
So first, the minute that this is closed, this will get 600 volt across this coil. This coil will close, bam, bam, bam. My 500 horsepower, 600 volt system is up and running. Does that make sense? Yes, no? Why it's important for us, I can't emphasize, guys. This side, us, the 600 volt and the 500 horsepower, that's us. That's the interface between PLCs into the magnetic starter. If you don't know that this is, this could be your magnetic starter right here. This box is your magnetic starter. Can you guys see that coming to a magnetic starter? And ignore the neutral here for a second. Any question guys about this? You'll see a couple of pictures similar to this too. Okay, so that's basically the inputs and the outputs. Very important to look at the, how they isolate the inputs and outputs. You can see how the light is isolation, isolate the inputs or outputs via light. So you, whatever signal you have in the outside world is not interfering. When you bring it to the PLC, it's not going to interfere with your PLC. Internal relays, guys, what they do is they created, since it's logic and it's zero one, they can create unlimited. That's the nice thing about PLCs. You can create unlimited amount of timers for the most part, unlimited amount of timers, and um, and relays and contactors driven by these timers and counters and so forth. That's the beauty of it. So you can you have uh, actual logic created by all these relays. They're all imaginary devices. So the nice thing, if you have a relay system, guys, that you have to have a, when you have a timer, you have to have a coil for a timer. If you have a PLC, is your timers and counters, um, all these are relays. They could be virtual relays, so-called imaginary virtual relays inside the computer don't exist in the physical world. Who cares? Programming, if it doesn't exist, then I can change the, the uh, ladder and the programming directly through the computer, and I don't want to send the electrician and pay him $63 an hour, a union guy, to go rewire a magnetic contactor. Unfortunately, this is to reduce labor. Um, well, fortunately or unfortunately, depending on how you look at it. Okay, um, okay. so the manufacturers, guys, they provide the charts with numbers for all these relays. Certain numbers you can use for the coils. Others, here's my timers, my coils, my internal relay coils. So all assign different numbers for different uh, uh, a relay or timer or counter that you can use in your system. Here's what the timers internal. Again, internal relays. You can use them as counters and timers, big deal. No physical presence. That sticks. A lot of people who know how to wire guys magnetic starters and and, uh, and relays, they get very confused. When where's this? Where's this coil exist, Chad? It does not exist. This does not exist in real life. Um, okay, so all these guys, the programming, logic, timers, and um, so they when we put timers, guys, they have 0.1 seconds interval. So if you 0.1 one tenth of a second. Uh, one tenth of a second interval, so I can have a hundred one tenth of a second program it for ten seconds. Um, so really cool. Get all your timers and your counters, virtual timers and counters. No need for um, actual physical mechanical driven coil timers and coil and counters. So these are an example of timers and counters. We'll get into that one in uh, in a second here. So. When we get into the the programming for a sec with that one, um, okay. So that's basically all what we're gonna do, guys, about uh, about PLCs. We have on delay and off delay timers, guys, and 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 a, and a bunch of other things that you can use. The only thing I wanna I wanna emphasize, I have a diagram I'm gonna walk you through, so I'm gonna get into this one in a second here. Um, okay. So installing program of logic controllers. A couple of hints when you put them, keep your runs short, voltage drops and a bunch of other interference and so forth. Um, plan the route so nobody can interface with the route that you're gonna be put for your signal cables. Shielded cables, uh, good idea. Grounding, you have to ground the system. All your equipments have to be sitting at the same ground because if you have a, if you have a, volt, a ground difference between the neutral and the ground five volt, that could interface, interface with your input output devices. So these are a couple of hints that you have to keep in mind, shielded. Um, when you cross a power line, the, 
They always tell you to cross from the right angle like you this so you don't have magnetic interference with by the way the power if you have a if, if this is a 500 if this is a 480 volt and it's carrying here uh 2000 amp that's where you guys come in and i have a signal cable right next to it i as a, a an owner of 2000 amp 480 cable care less about your your signal your signal is not going to affect my my 2000 amp 480 cable but this amount of magnetic field of of current it could it could in, impose or induce voltage and current into this signal cable that will be interpreted as five volt at the end of that cable whatever voltage and um and could could give a false signal could give a false signal they always ask you guys about grounding equipment input output and sensors so you're taking uh, uh an equipment from input output and sensors if you have this could be there could be this could be zero volt here, and because of they are not bonded together, this could be uh, sitting at four volt. So in between them could be four volt. This enough to give you a false signal. So what do they do? If you guys, when we went to Allianz and we looked at the data center, I don't know how many of you. I took a couple of pictures of it. Saw that big. I bet you it was number at least number six if not number one, green um, grounding bonding conductor that bonding all these frames of these computers. These are very, very important when you do deal with electronic equipment to bond all the equipment together. So you can, they're all sitting at the same potential, all sitting at the same potential. The only way we can guarantee they're sitting at the same potential is to bond them together, the two devices, bond the two devices together with a wire. With a wire. Otherwise, the, if you have a shielded cable, they suggest that you you bond, you ground the shield in one side. If you ground it in two sides, you can have a current going between between. If I if I have a shield bonded from both sides, now I have four voltage between them. I, I will have a current going through the shield. Who cares? The question: is smaller current. Who cares? It could influence the signal. We're talking about smaller voltage, smaller amps here. When you get to 20 milliamps loops, guys, these are milliamps and 20, we don't, we don't, we're about 5 amps. Sometimes what do we say? 0.5 crystal or more, drop it. More point, less than 0.5, drop that. So imagine this, that 0.5 is a signal, major signal in the, in, in this industry. Major signal in this industry. Okay, so they have something called differential amplifier, guys. Differential amplifier, take the signal and subtract the two signals from each other and take the actual signal that you want to actuate with any noise any imposed interference from electromagnetic it will get rid of it so the most of the input devices will have some type of differential amplifier on them so it, it, it clears the, the signal so what does it do this day before living detects the voltage difference between a pair of wires which bring in your signal and because it takes the difference between them, any noise on both of them, it will be it will be deleted. So then that will get the noise. The word noise is a signal, an unwanted signal. That's what they call it, noise. Um, amplify and only amplify the difference voltage. Only amplify the difference voltage. So so it looks at anything that's um, coming between two terminals is a noise. Um, and it looks at if my signal that I need to amplify is this one, and there's a noise on it that's coming from whatever. And by the time you amplify it, it will look something like this. And what happened to the noise? Got canceled. They, it's like a filter. It looks at it. Are you noise? Yep, stay there. Are you signal? Yes, get in. And don't ask me about the electronics there and the filters that they put on them. It's a whole different animal. Okay, so that's your signal. You look at the inputs. The outputs coming in, as I said, you want to be the same. You want to mag magnify it or and anything else sitting on that baby want to sit, stay, stay on the other side because it will affect my, my signal. Any question guys about this? So that's all what I want you to understand, at least from this chapter. Any questions, any comments? I'm gonna show you a few input output devices before I, I'll let you quick break. Here's, um, uh, let's go directly into, here's my input output. This is very important to understand guys, how they um, isolate the input um, and the output. Uh, this is interesting, Chris. 
is multiple inputs. I have input one to input four, uh, input one, two, three, four, and also come in. That's how you bring the input into your PLCs. Each one of them has its own converter. It converts it into 24 volt dumbbell across the, um, the CPU or the PLC. Um, moving on, here's how they put the devices. This is, Chris, what you just asked. If you guys look at this, this is in very interesting. So I do have, a, this is the push button. Look what happened. If I put, here's my 120 volt, 120 volts here. Let's suppose, and these are four inputs, four inputs that's going to do something. Here's my, um, this will be a start button, my start button. If I go push this button, Chris, momentarily, I'm going to only pause 120 volts across this. This will translate to 24 volt here. This will dial it in here, 5 volt into the system. You got yourself a signal, an on. What do you do with this on is up to you when you program it. You got yourself a one. A digital one or an on situation. You got yourself a digital one or an on situation, right? Um, so here's my five volt, here's my zero volt. You got a one. What do you do with this one? It's up to you. Can you guys see all these input devices, how, how they wire them? All these input devices into the system. You bring these input devices directly to the system. So what do they do? I don't know if you can see. Um, for these, you bring the hot to one side of the device, the other side of the device as an input. Hot to one side of the device, the other device is the input. So here's my input devices. If I want to wire them in the PLCs, you bring the hot in here, out into the PLC. Hot, and the, all the common will be hot. You put the hot as a common, and the other end will go directly into the, uh, my PLCs. Any any questions, guys? Any questions about this? So that's my input bunch of input devices. Let's look at output devices. We talked about output. You can do outputs also via a relay, like we said, closing relays. Here's a bunch of output devices. We don't have a connection with them. Here's a bunch of output devices where you can send signal to a lot of other places. You can send signal to a lot of other places, guys and energize equipments and so forth. So I have four outputs coming out of this signal, four outputs coming out of this PLC. Any comments, any questions? Any comments, any questions? Okay, so the next chapter, guys, if you don't have any questions, I know this is just a quick introduction by any means. It's not going to get you an expert in, 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 in the PLCs, but it's good, at least get good understanding. Let's take five minutes break, and I'm going to go over one system, how to convert a, lo a relay logic into a PLC logic with a system. Uh, that will be chapter uh, 17. Really easy. See how the importance of it, and then uh, we're done. Five minutes break. Okay, um, so what we're going to do, guys, for this one, really easy, we're going to take, um, take a system and program it. Let me just show you a couple of things, what we're going to do. Um, Chris, here's a, here's a system, a system, a relay system that talks, here's a really, a complete, really good relay system um, control, and we need to program that control. So that's... Um, so let me, before I go ahead, guys, and do, let me just, because we're power, we're very familiar with the power system. So let me sh just show you the power part of that. Here's, here's all the magnetic contactors coming into, here's my, uh, this would be pump one, pump number one, right next to it, is coming to pump number two. And of course, you have the disconnect, and I'm just showing the control. And this is one M, 1M, and this is 2M, if you can imagine. All these magnetic contactors, um, 1M, 2M. And I have a control system, a control system that's supposed to control these two pumps. A control system that's supposed to control these two pumps. So look what's going to happen, guys. Um, and I need to convert this one into a PLC system. You need to convert it. This is a really logic. I need to convert it to PLCs. Very easy, very simple. 
If you understand this one, you will never go stray again. I can, so the way these are supposed to work, Chris, they do them in lift stations. I have two pumps. Everybody knows what a lift station is or a well house. Lift station, typical in well house or lift station. A well house is the, you know, a well, a well house is a house that has all the electronic equipment for a well that pump the water into the city. A lot of them all over. So pumping water into the city, city water system. A lift station is they take the sewer system from low area and they, co they combine them into a well that's a well house. A, a, a lift station they call it and then they pump all this sludge and all this bad stuff into the wastewater treatment plants anybody have seen them but all over you see lift, they call them lift stations very typical in the lift station look what, how this works these are this is the control system for it you have the option number one is let's just say the voltage on it is 120 this is just the control voltage these these are running at 480 volt system almost always 480 volt system 480 volt system. So here's the pump running at 480, and here's the control system. And from this side, by the way, here's my 480 volt transformer. And I'm not showing it here. All these are coming from the same. These are guys coming from phase A, phase B, phase C. To really complicate the situation here. So this will be going here. This will be going here. This will be going here. And also this will be going uh, here. This will be going here. And this will be going here, and I'll take one to here and one to the other side. That's how the system is wired in a, in a control box. Let's just a quick guys follow it. So um, a lot of people, I have a fuse first to fuse the control circuit. This is my control circuit. I have an on up position. I can put the situation in an up. I will. Look, I don't want any control, anybody to control it. I can put it in an off position. That's just safety. So turn it on off and keep it off. Okay, so that's your on up position. Then I need, um, this is a floating device that when the lift, when the sludge in that lift station reach a certain level, I want the pump to energize. So that floating switch, the way the, way the floating switch, so this is the most important thing that's gonna control the whole system. These are inside a well, both of them here. When the water reach this level, that switch that's wired is going to push a contact to close. When it pushes a contact, guys, this guy is going to close. And when it closes, two things, three things could happen. Number one, um, this, if, if this switch, this is selective switch, if I put this switch manually on one, so only pump number one will work right now. So if I, if I select, this is selection switch. If I select one, look what happens. When this is closed, then the power is, comes over here, so this is energized. This is going to say on, right? If when this is on, what's going to happen to bam, bam, bam? Now pump number one is pumping all this sludge out of that well. Cool? Uh, out of that lift station. All this stuff out of that lift station. And the same thing, when this is energized, it will close this contact. Can you see that, how it's closed to this contact? When it's energized, it's going to close this contact, so it's on. That's rule, rule number one. If you, by hand, so this one is on. Now if you go and switch it to this side, switch it to this side, then now pump number two is on when it calls on. So now number two is goes on, and up will go, and number one will go up. Cool? So now they're not on at the same time. Same thing, this will close. Uh, this contactor will close and off it goes. Now this is if you put them in manual, on off. You can choose which one of them on. But if you decided to do as you should, put them in auto, and you leave them here, very important things happen here. If you close this one as it should. So when this is, when this closes, this goes on, this contactor will close. Chris, all the one amp contact are gonna close. Um, all the one, no, I'm sorry, this one, the holding contacts in this case. So uh, one M is going to close, and at the same time, one M here is going to close, and I have a timer. So the timer start timing, um, timer, and um, when the timer times out, this will close, and this also is going to hold it. This is closed because of the, 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 the CR. And then this will open. Can you see that? And one M here 
was closed first because of uh, one name is on. So long story short, when when we are in auto, they have this loop here said that can guarantee. Here's how it should work. It should work the first time this kicks in, calls for lift. Pump one will work. Run, run, run for two hours. Now we reach where we should be. It turned off. That switch goes down. It turns off, right? Five hours later or two hours later, they call again. It turns on again. Instead of turning pump one this time, it switches it to pump two. So it alternates the two pumps. Why would they do it this way, guys? Redundancy in the system and exercising both of them. If you have one pump working all the time, the other one will not work when you need it. So you keep exercising both of them and redundancy in the system. So that's what it's supposed to do. The whole system is supposed to do is to get you redundancy in the system with, with these are timers and uh, timer control relay. So if when a control relay is open, I don't know if you guys can see, now this is open. Next time this calls for on, you can't, this will not be on. So the power is going to come right here, right? So next time, and this is already closed. So it's going to go directly into the M, this turn M2 on. Next time it's going to turn M2 on. And then when M2 is turned on, it will open this. Can you guys see when M2 is turned on? It will open this. They energize the timer. When the timer is de-energized, it opens this to de-energize the control relay, which in turn opens this and close this to sit it back into the whole system. I know it's, 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 it's a lot of jumping around. The whole idea from this control system, guys, is to get you one thing. Every time it calls to, for something to lift, the only thing, pump one will run. Next time, pump two will run. And then pump one, pump two, pump one, pump two, alternating them, alternating the system. So you can do this right now. You can take this one, go wire in our lap. No question asked. Or you can convert this one into, into, um, into a relay logic, into a relay logic. So... Huh? Even the stuff with yeah, so you guys went through the a whole control system. Okay, now take this and convert this into a PLCs. Now look, let me show you a very interesting thing. Now when you convert this one into a, a PLC logic, here's what you're looking at. Oops. Um, this is what you're looking at now. You grab this one. Now look what happened. Um, here's the, let me just, I want to highlight the, the most important things in the system. The most important things is M1. Here's M1 here. Here's your M1 here. So this is my PLC. First, this is my PLC. My PLC has uh, 16 inputs and um, how many outputs here? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Nine outputs. Cool. Outputs, inputs. So the outputs of this signal, Chris, we, you and I know these are going to be these are the outputs of the signal. So can you guys see what they do? This is because we don't, okay, what they do is they take 17, the output from the 17, this is overload, by the way, this one is overload, and they bring it to the coil of the motor, through the overload to the coil of the motor, from one side. From the other side, they take it to the neutral. From the other side, they take it directly to the neutral. Now, by doing that, you have just energized, you have just put 120, typically 120 here, coming, 120 volt, and I don't know if you guys can see the, the power coming in here. Can you guys see this is line one, this is the hot to come in. So you have just, every time you send the signal to 17 and close it, you just impose a 120 across the watt, the coil, and energize the coil to turn it on and off. Any question guys about the input circuit? Any question about the input circuit? My input circuit? I'm sorry, the output circuit? Thank you. The output circuit? So here's my output circuit. This is how it's interface with, with this is a relay logic, the PLC logic, relay logic. Does it make sense, guys? Make sense? The other thing is the input. Let's go to the input. Now, I want to continue, guys, with the neutral. They take the neutral as coming to this side. And then the hot, the hot was, I don't know if you can see, the hot is going all the way up and energizing all these. All these are coming from the same, so we're energizing the devices. Okay, Chris, let's go to the device number one. The first input, input number one, 
Input number one to the PLC is going to just coming from the on off switch right here. This is input one, number one. So I need to be able to know is the selection, is, is the system on or off, the whole system, is it on or off? That's very important. So number one is very, very important to get you the signal on. Is the system, so you bring, what do you do? You bring a hot to the switch, out of the switch, you bring it to the input PLCs. Any question about this? A hot is a 120. You take a 120, and from the 120, you bring it to the input of the PLC. Okay, second one, the second input that I need is the floating switch. The floating switch, I need to know, do I need to pump that or not? So another input is the floating switch. Here's the floating switch, another input. A third input, now, if you guys can see here, now here, how many how many choices do I need? I need to I need one input if pump one is on, and one input is pump two is on, and one input if both of them are in auto. So that's why they split this device here. I don't know if you can see, it's split into three inputs. This is the device, the selective device, right in here. So if from the selective device, they bring a hot, and out of the selective device, you bring three inputs. Because you, you personally, have to go decide, do I want to put it in pump one, or pump two, or, or, or auto? So that's, these devices are external. Each one of them is an input. Yes, sir? Right, right inside the equivalent. In, uh, all this uh, 24 volt or 5 volt right inside the equivalent. Everything they're looking at right now is 120 volt or whatever voltage is. Right now, all these equivalents here, you're bringing the blue, the blue is the hot of the 120, the green is the neutral of the 120. Can you see how they put them, both of them in the input and output? And there's different, and there's also input and output 24 volt. We have devices here on our S7200 that runs at 24 volt. Okay, any question guys about, but my point is, do you see all these wiring and chunk of wire that we did here, it translates into this wiring. That's it. So my question for all of you guys, including my friend Chris, what happened to the timer and what happened to the control relay? Where are the timers and the control relays when you move them to the PLC? They're gone. They no longer exist. They are not in the system. I no longer need a timer, a physical mechanical timer, electronic timer, because all of them are a function in the logic of the PLCs. Does that make sense? So that, if you guys can see the comparison between the two, this this is why PLCs is superior to the relay logic, right? Because I can do the same thing. I can make these two pump alternate via relays. I can wire it in a lab right now using relays in our lab, or I can wire it to an S7200 right on the wall here, which we did, and you can make the S7200 alternate them and drive it from your laptop via whatever program you, you decide to do. What I want to emphasize is, everybody guys see that where the inputs at the top, my inputs and outputs at the bottom, and how you're just, all what you're, what you really in reality is doing is bringing one wire from every input into for every device, input devices. The top, these are pilot devices, guys, all the inputs. The outputs obviously are, most of the time, are coils, coils to energize. Any question? Can I have thumbs up, guys, that we really understand that one? Because I know you're not going to be a programmer, but this is very, very interesting to understand. Just the concept, the concept of it. This, I use this one all the time, guys, when we do, to compare the relay logic with the PLC logic. This is, this will do the same function. These two of them are going to do the same function. Any question? So that's what I thought um, that could be. So now... Now that you guys believe that our inputs, <clears throat> all our inputs um, went from relays, uh, went from my relays, oops, into, uh, from my relays into the PLCs. Now let's go to the ladder diagram, right? Any question you have about the inputs, how it's gonna, the, the ultimate solution, remember, the ultimate solution is what? The ultimate solution is to get these PLCs to alternate these two pumps. Okay, let me show you. Any question going from the relays? One more time. Going from the relays into the PLC first. Now let's go from the PLC into the programming. Can we go there? Now I'm going to go, I am took you from the relays into the PLC. Let's go from the PLC into the program itself. So with this, I would like to entertain this boy here. Now Chris, 
You're going to help me with this, huh? So if you <clears throat> if you look at this now, now we converted. Now if you guys can, you can see we converted. <clears throat> we have our inputs and outputs. This is where you're going to be programming them. This is where the ladder diagram becomes inside your laptop. Ladder diagram inside your laptop. Can I just get you guys one little little things here? So Chris, number seventeen. Everybody guys can see where number 17 here is actually the relay. It's right here and it's driving M1. And number 18 is this coil represents this output which drives 2M. Can you guys see that? Everybody can see the outputs that's driven by this input. Okay, so that's the first thing. The second thing is the input input one. Can you guys see where input one is represented by an OB contact? And and two and four right here. And two and four. These are the inputs coming for pump number one, manual and the floating switch and the selection switch. Okay. And I'm gonna go do, down into the second one. So number then. Number one again, oops, let's go to the pump number two first. So this is pump number two. Go to number two, here's one again, with two again, the floating switch with four this time, with selection, with four, um, which is auto, four is auto, yep, four, four should be the same, four is auto here, and one. So these two will give you to run the pump on auto one or two. Okay, so the first branch, the first, let me just put it this way without complicating. This branch goes right here, is to get you to run this pump in auto. This branch also to run it on auto. The branch right underneath it is to get you to run them in manual. Get you to run them on manual, on manual. And all this junk at the bottom is to take care of the counter, the, the, the timer. So you can alternate them. You can alternate them. The only thing I want to mention here before I go is um, when we talk about ladder diagram, you have to understand a few things here, guys. Let me just erase this one before it's complicated. It. When you talk about relay, the first thing you need, you need to understand, first you start from right to left, right? When you write your ladder diagram, right to, uh, I'm sorry, left to right, and you always have to end up with what? Always end up with a coil. Every round has to end up with a coil. <laughs> Can you guys see how every one of them is going to end up with a coil? Every one of them, you have to end up with a coil. Um, every input will be represented by or either normally open contact or normally closed contact. Normally open contact or normally closed contact. So Chris, in order to run this on auto, one has to close. Here's my one, close. And two has to close and four has to close. And then 17 is on, so it latches and now 17 is running on, in this case, on auto. In order to run 18 in auto, one also have to close, two also have to close, and four have to close, and then 18 is on, latch it, and now my 18 is running in auto. In order to run them manually, the second line has to close. One also has to close, three in this case, and two. The only difference is we got three here, and then now we're running in, uh, on manual. Same thing here, running on manual. The rest of it, the bottom guys, is to get you the timer that's going to flip the system every time you start. Flip the system every time you start. Any question about this? If you are interested, guys, we did this one in our PLCs. It's in the YouTube channel too. The whole exercise here, we program it with S7200, and it's... Um, and it, it's up and running. So, so that's that's basically the basics of the basics. And I didn't talk about the timers here. I'm going to save you a few things uh, off delay and on delay because it's not and and timers and all this stuff. This is a 10 second timer. What they what they do, guys? They <clears throat> when pump number two, when pump number one, um, when the floating switch goes off. It gives 10 seconds for pump number one to keep running for 10 seconds. After 10 seconds, it stops, and the relay, the timer will de-energize to put the system in a situation where, not, where pump number two is going to start next time the system calls for, for pumping. 
Any question, guys, about this? And, uh, and my intention is, yes, sir. Yeah, we do. We have a special, nah, yeah, you have to have a special di uh, software. What they do, the software that we use with S7200 and the logo, there are two softwares. You program them with your laptop, you guys have them. I know we didn't use them for you, but the, uh, the electricians use them. And then the nice thing about this software is not just a, it's not drafting. You can draft this, this one with any software. Draft. This is an active software. You can download it into the machine so you can talk to the machine and you can retrieve the info from the machine too. It's a ladder diagram. Ladder schematic diagram. So you can you can now after you put them in, Chris, you can push a button, download it into, upload it into the PLCs, and push a button to try it while you are connected to the PLCs, um, or you can download the system from the PLCs too. So it's really it's an interactive software. It's not just the drafting software, though you can draft it with any software. The software that need need to be interactive, so you can upload it to the machine, download it from the machine if needed. And again, I spared you guys talking about the timers, off delay and on delay timers and so forth, but, um, but that will give you the, the flavor of it. My main intention is to get you how to go from relay logic into PLC logic and then do the programming. Any comments, any questions? So that's basically the, that system. Let me see. If I if we missed a few things here, so that's what I wanted to to basically get you to the ladder diagrams, imports, external imports, um, devices. Here you go. We talked about that one. Um, here's um a couple of things, guys, about ladder diagrams. You have your imports. That the one that we're looking at, one through sixteen, is designated for imports. Seventeen through twenty-four outputs. Relays, internal relays, these are the numbers that are designated by this manufacturer. Yes, it's meaningless unless you use this manufacturer. And these are the numbers that, that related. So you can't use, if you want a timer, you can't use 100. You have to use a, so every manufacturer guys have a designated numbers that you can only use for, for inputs, outputs, um, and, and, and internal relays and timers and counters and so forth. Talked about this one. <clears throat> Um, the overload. One thing, guys, you notice when we were talking, when we brought the output into the contactor, they keep the overload. The industry likes to keep the overload outside the PLCs. Though you can have a contactor to protect from overload inside the PLCs, uh, for redundancy, you they like that normally closed contact overload that we all know to keep it into the magnetic starter for safety. That's another thing. Um, you can have another overload as a redundancy. This just talks about, guys, how to, when you do your schematics or schematics or ladder diagram so forth, you start from the left to the right, top to bottom, always end up, uh, Chris, the key point is you can't end up one wrong without a coil. You end up with a coil. Uh, contacts are labeled. Every con when, the, when you label the contacts, they labeled by the same number of the coil. If you don't understand, you would never understand control. If a coil says 50, so all the contacts that are labeled 50 are driven by the same coil, either mechanically, physically driven, or it could be uh, um, a microprocessor driving it, or it could be uh, electronic relays and so forth. Um, relays inside, they have an infinite number of contacts you can drive from it. Um, the same thing, guys, the, the coils, yeah, the output, Every output has to have a coil. You guys remember how the two pump contacts, what did they do for them? To drive the pump contact itself, they have a coil. So you, you cook, 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 and at the end, energize a coil, internal coil. That means an output. So you cook, cook here, and energize a coil, internal coil. That's the same signal to an output. So if you guys remember, each one of these have each, every time you need an output, you have to have a coil, in, an internal coil. I'm sorry? So there must just be a left over word. A coil? Yeah. Internal coil. Yep, yep. There's no there's no these are hypothetical coils. There's no real coils. It's just a make. What is that? A make. A make. 
diagrams. Okay, so these are just a couple of things about the ladder diagrams, guys. This is just talking about the system that we did here. Um, so really, this is what I wanted to, to show you basically from this. <clears throat> if I can get you um, three things, oops, to get that, to, to get you guys, um, let me go back one more time into my wiring. Here's how we went from, um, we went from the relay, converted this relay directly into, connected to the PLCs, and from the PLCs we went into the programming. Any questions, any comments? If you want a very simple lesson to understand the very basic wiring and programming of PLCs, that lesson is, is what you're looking for. The same example, guys, we did it in YouTube, and it's running. If you go to Control Chat, and it's, uh, it's one of the bit, the first one that we did at night in one of my classes that I did. I covered the PLC class, and we did it in there. It was really cool. Any comments, any questions? So my uh, my intention of this class not to make you PLC programmers as much as uh, get your interest into this uh, interesting field. You add this one to your knowledge of power tools for Windows, Revit, and all this good stuff, and you become very powerful. Hopefully. Okay. That's all I have. Any comments, any questions? Phil, my friend, you're interested in the pumps, and these are, no? 